for the first time in about two weeks, I get to be on the call in person in the flesh. And what a joy it is to see all of your faces in these boxes. And I'm certain that you um, share my sentiments that this has probably been one of the most enlightening, informative, and inspirational intensives that we have had. I want to take a moment and just ask you to thank God for Dr. Catherine Stout, who has shared with us so generously over the past three weeks. What a gift and blessing uh, she has been. And she is, belongs to us. She's a member of CNBC. We didn't have to go out and find anybody. She was right there in our congregation. And uh, I just thank God for her scholarship and for her yes. And I told her as we were preparing to uh, sign on to the call, uh, that she understands that even though this is the end of this intensive, this is not the end of these kinds of uh, experiences because there's just so much history uh, that we need to know as African-Americans and she is well equipped uh, to help us. I'm gonna ask if um, Deacon Christine Nams, Deacon Nams, can you uh, unmute yourself tonight to lead us in, in prayer? Okay, if I can get it just a moment here. We hear you. We can hear okay. you. Okay, so I, I'm ready then. You want me to start now? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. God, we come this afternoon, this evening, thanking you, God, for another day. Thank you for your loving kindness and your tender mercy. We thank you for Dr. Stout, all that she has uh, had to do and say to enrich us, oh God. So Father, I ask God in the name of Jesus that you will continue, continue to use her, oh God. We thank you for our pastor and everyone that's on the line. Lead and guide us tonight in Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're in Dr. Stout's hands. I don't want to get in the way of whatever she has to say tonight. Thank you so much for that prayer. And thank you, Pastor, uh, for being here and for, for asking me to do this. I've had great fun. And this has been a wonderful, wonderful distraction for me uh, during a very difficult season at work. So I just thank you guys. You have brought me so much joy. And now I think we are ready to end this series. Deacon Sean, are we ready? <laughs> you can put the slides up now. Uh, so this is part four. We are going black to the future, the election of 2044. And no, that is not a typo. We're going to do the election of 2044. So let's count back what we have done so far. Uh, feel free to unmute yourselves. What was part one? Who or what did we talk about in part one? Anybody remember? Anybody want to unmute or put it in the chat? Hmm. Erasing of history with uh, Mary Winchester. Mary Winchester, right. Our founding first lady, Mary, uh, Mary Winchester or, or Maria Winchester. Marie Winchester, yes. All right. Part two. Part two might be a little bit more difficult. Part two. Does anybody remember what we talked about in part two? I showed you a map. We talked about the black towns in part two. We talked about the black towns. Yes, we talked about the black towns. I love how a par uh, pastor called them sanctuary cities. Yes. So we talked about the black towns in part two. And I showed you the map to show you the vastness of what our people created. And, and to also make this argument that we created a lot of stuff in rural America that we don't get credit for. Um, and then from there, and if you remember nothing else from part two, I want you to just put this in your note, Castor and Belt, Castor and Belt, Castor and Belt, because that is the mm -hmm. one that was founded by a black woman in the West. And I think she needs her, uh, her due props. She was in Montana, I believe. All right. Part three, 
Deacon Sean, I know you listened to part three. <laughs> <laughs> what did we talk about in part three, Deacon Sean? Black people in country music. Black people <laughs> in country music. I'm teasing her because I think she really loved that one. Uh, that might have been one of her favorite. And today we are going Black to the Future, the election of 2024. All right, next slide. Thank you all for remembering that. That's awesome. Uh, just a little bit about me. I won't spend as much time, but this is funny. I always thought that this was a good way for you guys to get to know me during this series because I am kind of quiet and kind of shy if you meet me in person sometimes. I'm a back row faithful. I'm always on the back row. But I thought you might get a kick out the fact that I failed my first church public speaking gig. I was about 13, I believe, 13 or 14, and they asked me to do the announcement to announce that the choir annual choir concert was coming and we were in the old sanctuary and guys i did such an awful job i stumbled the words i misread i was embarrassed i cried all that night so this is kind of redemption for me i've come a long way since 14. so thank you guys for giving uh the girl who really messed up at 14 another chance all right because i still hold that uh, I am a, a scholar, a writer, a chief uh, communication officer who promotes social good. That's what I do, no matter my job or my role. And I put, I'm a political strategist. I put that in quotes because I am not really one, but I love to be a couch political strategist. I love watching politics. I love talking politics. I get it honest. I was raised in a political family. Donna Brazile is my personal hero. Uh, she is a one of the most famous U.S. strategists. I have a picture of her on the next slide. And I call myself a pint-sized uh, speech writer because I have been writing campaign speeches since I was about 12 or so. Uh, campaign speeches and campaign slogans. I really get a kick out of it. Uh, I tell Ramesh Ackberry all the time, I'm ready to write her speeches when she runs for president. So y'all just let her know. Just put that in her ear. I tell her every day, but y'all help me out because I want to do this when she runs. All right, next slide. And this is our scripture for the night. Uh, it's uh, one that is often preached, and I'm sure you've seen it before. It's Mark 5, 8 through 9. For he had said to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? He replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. And I'll read that one more time. I can read a lot better than I could at 13, 14 when I stumbled. So I want to show you that I can actually read to redeem myself. For he had, he had said to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? He replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. So that is our centering verse for tonight. And we can go to the next slide. And just a brief um, synopsis of this. I won't go too deep, but I'll tell you how I always connect to this quote personally. Uh, in Mark 5, Jesus travels to a region where he encounters a man who, uh, possessed by a legion or group. Legion means group of demons. Jesus demonstrates his power over the evil spirit by casting out the demons into a herd of pigs and freeing the man from torture. Um, I always connected to this because the word legion, although it means group or many or multiple or vast, it also has a political connotation. Um, it can mean a military, an army, or a, an attack branch of the government. So that's why we often say a legion is a military, but really it is, it is an attack unit of the government. And so whenever I see this, I always think of those double meanings as someone who loves words and loves etymology. I always think of those double meanings of not only vast, but vast in a governmental military attack form. All right. And so this is our centering thought for tonight. And you'll see how we'll play with that word lesion in multiple ways. All right. So now we'll go to our next slide. This is all about campaigns and elections tonight. 
We're going Black to the Future, the campaign of 2044. And no, I did not say that. That's not a mistake. I know we are in 2024, but I am looking ahead to 2044. But before we get there and march through history up to that moment, I wanted you to share your thoughts. What are some tactics campaigns use to energize their base or generate support for their candidates? What are some tactics campaigns use to energize their base or generate support for their candidates? Uh, I invite you to unmute or type in the chat, whichever you feel most comfortable. Town hall meetings. Town hall meetings, yes. Town hall meetings, yep. I'm seeing in the chat promises, catchy phrases. Yes, I love writing campaign slogans. I really get a kick out of writing campaign slogans. So I love the catchy phrases. Uh, promises, false promises. So let me see who this is. Uh, Hawkins said promises and Jones said false promises. I need to get them in a room together there. All right, we got the optimist and the pessimist there. Scare tactics, saying what they want to hear. Yes, Kim Collins said scare tactics in the chat. And we're going to talk a little bit about scare tactics tonight. Uh, next slide. Fear mongering, yes. So I always say, and this is just something I came up with, that uh, vote means voice of the energized, right? Uh, oftentimes, it is not about candidates. It's about complacency, right? I, You are not competing against a candidate. You are competing against complacency. Complacency, people are just not interested enough to vote. And so I always say that a vote is the voice of the energized, and you have to get your base energized. And we're gonna look at ways that people have done that that connect to black history and black to the future over a few different campaigns. So now let's go to my girl, my favorite uh, political strategist. Now this is Donna Brazil. Now y'all know the old Donna, this is the new Donna. And I wanted to put some respect on her game and use a new picture. Cause I'm gonna tell you, if I ever get money, you're not gonna recognize me either, all right? So I love the Donna Brazil makeover. All right. And this is a quote. I took out the name because I know that this is a, uh, a church and kind of a nonpartisan event. So I took out the name of who she was referring to and just put there. All right. Their strategy has been to try to mirror the electorate, to mirror the fears, their anger, their animosity, their prejudice, and the media loves it because it's outrageous. Their strategy has been to try to mirror the electorate, to mirror their fears, their anger, their animosity, their prejudices, and the media loves it because it's outrageous, all right? This is one of my favorite Donna Brazil quotes. She is super smart, and I think um, the Democratic Party has not been as kind uh, as it should to her. She deserves all the flowers, in my opinion. All right, so next slide. So I want you to remember that phrase, mirror their fears, mirror their fears, mirror their fears. I want you to remember that as we walk to the future. And I'm gonna start us here, all right? Uh, the presidential election of 1956, Stevenson versus Eisenhower. All right, uh, Stevenson is Adelaide Stevenson. All the way with Adelaide was his famous slogan. What was uh, Eisenhower's slogan? Let me see if anybody remembers or is paying attention in history class. It's probably one of the most famous slogans of any political campaign. Anybody know Eisenhower's political slogan? Was it I like Ike? It's I like Ike, yes, yes, yes. So because he had I like Ike and that was very popular and it rhymed, Adelaide Stevenson had to have something that rhymed too. So all the way was Adelaide was the best he could come up with, all right? So Adelaide did not win. But this is one of his quotes. The truth is not that our policy has the communists on the run. The truth is that we are losing the military advantage, the economic initiative, and the moral leadership. The truth is not that we are winning the Cold War. 
the truth is that we are losing the Cold War. Now, if you go back to the 1950s, remember, this is the period after World War II. And the big enemy then is the USSR, right? And this fear that communism is spreading and taking over the world. Uh, we will later go to the fear of a communist Cuba. I just got back from Cuba in January. And I can tell you of all the places I've visited, and I've visited about 15 countries, I believe, Cuba is the one that I feel like I'm, I have misunderstood the most. And I had to re-educate myself and it was just eye-opening. Because of this, um, this fear of communism that I had grown up with studying American history, reading about American history, and you just see it over and over again. So Eisenhower wants to play on this fear of communism. If you elect, I mean, Stevenson, excuse me, Stevenson, if you elect Eisenhower, you are electing a communist. Let's go to the next slide. And then we also see this throughout the 1950s and the 1960s, that civil rights and integration is tied to communism. Why? Because what did Donna Brazil tell us? Mirror their what? Fears. So if the fear is communism, then I'm going to tell you that if you are trying to do civil rights, if you are trying to immigrate, then you in integrate, excuse me, integrate, then you are a communist. And I picked these images because both of these images have a Tennessee connection. The image, I don't know if you are mirrored, but the image on my left, which is the group image, was actually taken in Nashville. And this is during Nashville school integrations. The image on my right was taken at a place that Pastor Stewart spoke at last year. <laughs> Uh, this was taken at the Highlander Folk School is what we used to call it. I don't know. It's, it's, it changed its name a couple of years ago, but it was taken at the Highlander Center. And the Highlander Center, you have to know this, this is in Tennessee, and it's just like, uh, it's a jewel in Tennessee that we don't talk about enough. Highlander Folk School is a training center for social justice activism. What you should know about Rosa Parks, and I, I love that they talked about this last Sunday in church, is that Rosa Parks was trained at Highlander before she refused to get off the bus, right? So Rosa Parks knew what she was doing. I feel like we have misrepresented Rosa Parks, but Rosa uh, Highlander Folk Center or Highlander Folk School it was a training ground, a historical training ground for social justice activists. And I believe, Pastor Stewart, you spoke at their children's gala last year. Is that right? If I, if I remember the agenda right? I was at the um, Children's Defense Fund, actually. Okay. The uh, Haley Farms is where I was. With, oh, you were uh, at Haley Farms. Okay. Yeah, with Dr. Starsky Wilson, Wilson, Wilson in um, Hennings, Tennessee. In Hennings, Tennessee. All right, all right. Another, another <laughs> famous center, but not the same as Highlander. But I will add that Ashley Woodard Henderson Woodard, I believe that's her last name, Woodard, is a virtual uh, member of our church. And she works, I think she's still at the Highlander Institute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're still doing great work. Yeah. They're still doing great work uh, and still, you know, they change with the time, whatever the causes are at the time. So this is a picture of King not being a communist or at a communist training school, but learning the tenets of social justice. I think this is so important that we tell our young activists this. Yeah. Uh, if you are on the call, if you are listening, our young activists, your 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 forefathers and foremothers and uh, foreparents, they trained. They received training and coaching. And I'll tell you this one other thing, and then we'll move on to the next slide. One of my favorite things that I learned about the Black Lives Matter movement. I was in St. Louis when Mike Brown was shot. Sometimes we forget the name Mike Brown, but Mike Brown, of course, was the one who was shot in Ferguson. And I was kind of talking to a guy from Ferguson at the time. So I knew Ferguson. I had been in and out of Ferguson all the time. Uh, 
And I remember when those activists started to form and get their organization together and trying to figure out their next steps. And secretly, he never said anything to anyone. He didn't publish it. He didn't want media. He didn't tweet about it. But Harry Belafonte flew to town multiple times to St. Louis to help those young activists organize and learn how to strategize. And I always remember that about Belafonte. Uh, I always respected him for that. So Highlander was a famous training ground. It is important if you're going to do activism to learn. All right, next slide. So communism was the big fear and the big thing that they talked about in the 1950s and 1960s elections. And then I fast forwarded a little bit to 1988, Dukakis versus Bush. How many on the call remember this? If you do, just put in the chat, I remember. I remember, just type in the chat, I remember. Yeah, we have some of them coming up, right? Right? So this is 1988. I would love for somebody who remembers to unmute and tell me about this commercial and what fear it played on. Doctor, uh, I'm from New Jersey. Mm -hmm. um, at the time, my mom was actually working with Olympia Dukakis, his cousin. And it was a huge deal in my town in Montclair, New Jersey, because they have relatives and stuff there. And so people were saying, how um, how dare we support somebody that's trying to uh, bring prisoners out? And it was just, just so much disinformation and it caused so much problems in our usually sort of quiet town because they were associating even her. And so she's an actress and everything. So it was even going into Hollywood about, you know, you're following these things. And it was so much misinformation that I was I remember being I was I was thinking it was only like 16 or 17 and I just I just remember being like wait this doesn't make it, it, even when you looked at the facts it didn't make sense and I kept asking my mom why do people believe this because you can see it's lies but everybody was really believing it so I just that's what I mostly remember how easily provable it was that it was a lie but everybody was going with it and then when he lost I really couldn't believe it yeah, yeah. So Dukakis was a politician from Massachusetts, I believe. Thank you so much. Uh, just, And I'm glad that you have that vivid memory to kind of give us context of how big a moment this was. This was such a huge moment in U.S. political history, not only in this campaign, but I think this was a salient moment in U.S. political history. And just to hear about the ripple effects it had to the rest of his family and to the town, I mean, it's just amazing. Um, to walk you through a little bit of what's happening here. This is Bush versus the caucus. Uh, I think this is Bush one, if I remember correctly. And um, Willie Horton was someone who was in jail, who was allegedly given a weekend pass to get out of jail, a uh, home visit, and then come back. This is a system that a lot of jails use when someone has demonstrated good behavior. Um, but unfortunately, uh, Horton committed murder while he was, quote, on that weekend pass. Not, uh, and he raped a white woman. He committed a crime against a white woman. I'm trying to go back to my memory to think about if it was rape or murder. But I remember it was a crime against a white woman. So you play on this fear of this, you know, big black criminal, big black villain and if you are associated with him, then you are somehow part of that, you know, uh, demonic, big black, fear of the big, big black man, right? And that was the image that this campaign ad was trying to play on, that if you support Dukakis, then our country is going to be taken over by black rapists and black murderers. Uh, I have a short clip that I want to show you. I think it's only 90 seconds. So I'm going to ask Deacon Sean to uh, go to that clip right quick, uh, just to give us some context. Because this is a PDF, I don't know if it's going to play in here. You might have to uh, pull it up. She's going to pull it up on YouTube for us.
as she pulls it up, and we'll, we'll give her a few more minutes to pull up, as she pulls it up, does anybody else remember this Dukakis versus Bush? Does does anybody else remember that ad, that, that Willie Horton ad? Yeah, yeah, I see some hands raised. Kim, Kim Collins, I think I saw your hand, and then Pastor Stewart, I think I saw your hand. Do you remember that, that ad in 1988? I don't remember the ad, but I remember the specific ad, but I do remember when Michael Dukakis ran against Bush. And of course, now that you are bringing it up again, you've refreshed my memory about the way in which uh, his affiliation with this Horton person was used to create fear among the populace, the yeah. misinformation. The misinformation, right? Mm -hmm. As if Dukakis had something to do with it, right? Right. And, and really, he didn't. He was the governor of the state. He was so far removed from the incident, but just linking him to it because it was the same state. And then actually using right. the mugshot of a Black man, right, at that time. Um, it was just a quite a powerful ad. Deacon Sean, if you can't get the YouTube clip, we can go back to the slides because I think... Uh, I think people understand the connection. Just let me know. I have it. I was just waiting on y'all to finish. Um, oh, okay. All right. Perfect. Thank you. Can you see it? No, we can't see it. We just see a black screen. I'm going to try one. Oh, there we go. Perfect. We can see it. Oh, okay, good. Use I. So racial cues, I think, are historically, it's been about the Republicans saying to voters, we are, we understand your interests as white people. We, un we want to preserve those prerogatives. We will not be affiliated with black interests. And then historically for Democrats, um, or at least since the 60s, it's been how to negotiate the public perception by some whites that they're too affiliated with black voters, right? So. Um, the classic case, of course, is the Willie Horton ad in 1988, where um, George Bush, the first George Bush, his campaign ran this advertisement on television saying um, that Michael Dukakis, as governor, had let had run this furlough program for prisoners in which um, Willie Horton, a black uh, convict, had been released and then uh, supposedly had raped a white woman while being released. So the insinuation, this is you know, a classic example of racial cueing. The insinuation is, if you elect Governor Dukakis as president, we're gonna have black rapists running amok in the country, right? So it's playing mm -hmm. to white fears about black crime. And that was an incredibly effective, really masterful ad. And he's still talked about political scientists now use this as a verb. Like candidates talk about not wanting to be Willie, Willie Hortonized, right? Um, it's, it still sort of sets the bar for racial cueing because it is such a, a masterful example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. You can you can pull the slides. Thank you. Can we give Deacon Sean a hand? Because I, I gave her a curveball tonight with, with putting a slide up for me. So thank you for that, Deacon Sean, as she gets the slides uh, back ready. Um, racial cueing is the word that she used in there. And sometimes we call this... Uh, racism without racist or racism mm -hmm. without saying the word black or without saying the word race, right? Racial cueing, right? Uh, so all this ways, remember we, we talked about integration and, and, and school integration and civil rights, they're communists, right? If you are associated with black people and you're associated with these things, you must be a communist. Now it's criminalization. Mm -hmm. If you are associated with Black people in any way, then you must be supporting criminals and you must be a criminal yourself. Now let's go to the next one. Let's get a little closer to home. The Senate election of, 20, of, of 2006, Corker versus Ford, Ford mm -hmm. Jr., all right? I'll just read a little bit of this New York Times article. I'll read the first two paragraphs. And there's a there is a question on the side. What do you remember about the Herald call me 
campaign ad of 2006. All right, here we go. I'll read the New York Times. Ad seen as playing to racial fears. The Tennessee Senate race, one of the most competitive and potentially decisive battles of the midterm election, became even more unpredictable this week after a fury over Republican television uh, commercial that stood out even in a year of negative advertising. The commercial, financed by the Republican National Committee, was aimed at Representative Harold E. Ford Jr., the Black Democrat from Memphis, whose campaign for the Senate this year has kept the Republicans on the defensive in a state where they never expected to have trouble holding the seat. Harold, call me, is what this ad is now referred to as. Anybody remember this ad? And if so, what do you remember about it? I'd love for someone to unmute and tell us what you remember about this ad. I know my mother remembers it. Mm. All right, do I have to jog our memory? Is And I think that's why this is so good because something that could be such a big moment at one point of time, we lose that history and we forget about it. So let's go to the next slide. So in this ad, it set as the premise that Harold Ford Jr. had once attended, I think, a Super Bowl party that was also sponsored by Playboy. I think it was sponsored by like 50 people, right? Like 50 people gave money to this Super Bowl party, but one of the donors was Playboy. And so in this ad, there was a, a woman who pretended like she was a Playboy Bonnie. And it made this sensation that Harold Ford Jr. was not only this wild bachelor who was out, you know, sowing his royal oaks and he would never be a good family man, a good Christian man like Bob Corker, but also <gasps> he's sleeping with white women. How dare he? How dare this little black boy from Tennessee flirt with, sleep with, uh, integrate with white women. And that was the racial fear that it played on. Not only that he is this wild playboy and we know like this image of the oversexed black man, right? Is one of the stereotypical images of African-American men that they put out. But also he is playing with white women. He's sleeping with white women. He is seizing our white women, almost in a way, the same way that Willie Horton was sensationalized because it was not only that he raped someone, but he raped a white woman. And this is a quote from a Vanderbilt pro professor that's in this New York Times article. John Greer, a professor at Vanderbilt University and a specialist in political advertising said that it is playing to a lot of fears and frankly makes the Willie Horton ad look like child's play. This is 2006 Corker versus Ford. Remember what Donna Brazil told us. Mirror their fears, right? Remember what Donna Brazil told us. Mirror their fears, right? If you mirror their fears, you energize the base. So the fear of communism, the fear that you will integrate with our kids and then eventually date our kids or rape our women and marry our women, mirror their fears. Now let's go to the next one. We get into the Obama era and we're going to flip it a little bit. I remember when Obama did this because I just thought it was brilliant. I'm just going to tell you, I thought it was brilliant. This was a 2008 campaign. So this is candidate Obama. I wanted to put president, but he wasn't quite the president there, right? And he said in a campaign speech, 
Nobody here thinks that Bush or McCain has a real answer for the challenges we face. So what are they going to try? So what they're going to try to do is make you scared about me. You know, he's not patriotic enough. He's got a funny name. You know, he doesn't look like all of those other presidents on the dollar bills. I thought that this was a really smart moment by Obama because basically he really just talked to what he knew was going to be the attack strategy against him to say, you are not like us and we should be afraid of you. What they're going to try to do is make you scared about me. So he just called the demon by its name, right? If this is what, if these are the campaign strategies, you can tell that Obama had been watching campaigns or had a strategist on his team who had been watching these tactics. And he just called it out before they could even ever be used on him first. And this made McCain just hot. I remember McCain's blowback too. And I will say, you know, <laughs> I think as it goes, McCain was probably, you know, a pretty fair politician. And of all the people for it to be used on, maybe McCain was like not the best guy. I could I could think of a lot of other people who I'd like to Obama one up. But it was what it was, all fair in love and politics. Isn't that what they say, right? So Obama just really riled up McCain when he said this. And McCain just went on a war path across all the morning shows saying that Obama is playing the race card. I've never said anything about his race and he's using this against me. But once again, Obama knows the strategies. He knows what the other side has used often to what? Energize their base because a vote is what? The voice of the energized. So if this is your weapon, then I am going to use your weapon against you. All right, now let's go to 2024. I remember one morning I was watching the political news shows and I heard this quote and I'll never forget. It was 2021 at the time, all right? It was 2021 and I heard this quote on one of the talk shows. The road to 2024 is through the classroom. The road to 2024 is through the classroom. I heard this in 2021. It immediately, as a historian, brought me back to those images of the Nashville integration and the parents calling those who are trying to immigrate communists because the battleground became the classroom. And here we are again, right? I always say the past is present. The past is present. Here we are again. The battleground became the classroom. And what we saw, this map is something I put together in 2022, if I remember correctly. I can't remember if it was 21 or 22. But I put this map together in 21 or 22 of all the states that had passed um anti-CRT laws or laws limiting the way that we talk about race and racism. And then, of course, we see down here in Florida, schools become flashpoints for Republicans eyeing 2024 presidential race. Let's go to the next slide to bring this a little closer to home. Because it's not only in the high school classroom, is also in the college classroom. These two stories are very new. CRT might have been last year's story, but this is this year's story. Delta State in Mississippi is facing closure if a Senate bill that has been proposed passes. Delta State is one of your HBCUs in Mississippi. Tennessee State right there in Nashville. There is a measure in the Senate, there is a, a bill in the Senate now, well, I guess it's not quite a bill yet, but there is a proposal in the Senate now that would vacate the board of Tennessee State University. So I imagine that we might have some Delta State 
or Tennessee State fan, uh, alums on the call. But if not, I'm wondering if you followed either of these bills. And if so, I would love for someone to unmute and share your thoughts of these two bills and what's going on. Rochelle uh, Andrews in the chat said they are trying to avoid paying them the money they owe them. Yeah, we've seen that a lot with the Tennessee State. What Tennessee State uh, did that was brilliant was calculated the back pay that they were owed due to underpayment by the state, right? And so some see this kind of vacating of the board as a way to as a way for uh, U.S. capital, U.S. state government uh, to not pay what is owed to Tennessee State. Yeah, yeah. Anybody else following the Delta State and the Tennessee State controversies that are happening? What I'm interested in seeing is if we start hearing about other HBCUs. What I noticed and why I put together the CRT map is that sometimes news can be so localized, right? And I wanted to put together the legislation from all across the country. This is February, and both of these came out in February of this month. These are just a couple of days, a couple of weeks ago. Keep your ears open for what is happening to our HBCUs because the road to 2024 is through the classroom was what one strategist said. We have seen this in not only the CRT uh, programs for our K through 12 or, or anti-CIT laws, excuse me, but also a lot of colleges have began to close their uh, centers for diversity. Next slide. Dr. Stout. Yes. They are also trying to keep division and ruckus about our history and make, and they're making that a wedge issue to say, we don't appreciate wokeness. We don't appreciate your knowing so much about yourself and um, setting up division again. So those, and even in, in the area of student loans, they don't want those loans forgiven because they think more of our children have benefited from them. And they want to keep that separated and they don't want to pay the money they owe those institutions to keep school, even education equal. So to pay that money takes from them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that is definitely one side of it, right? What happens when uh, our populace becomes less and less educated? right? And less and less able to compete because they don't have the college degrees or the credentials. The other side of it, it is a political strategy to what? Energize, right? Because a vote is what? The voice of the energize. And how do we energize? With scare tactics is one way that People have historically energized, right? And so I'm going to go to the one on my right first, the white box. It says, Senate Bill 17 outlawed diversity, equity, and inclusion offices at public universities in Texas. The Texas State DEI office, the Division of Inclusive Excellence, closed on August 1st, 2023. No, this is not just Texas, because just as all of the CRT bills, I here's a pattern I have noticed that I have followed. It starts in Florida, it goes to Texas, and then it comes to Tennessee. That's the triangle, Florida, Texas, Tennessee. Tennessee is usually the third or the fourth one in line, but a lot of these bills start in Florida. 
And this is a more recent one. DEI programs face legal and corporate challenges. Uh, now, I must admit, I'm a little embarrassed to admit that I drive a Tesla. I love my Tesla. I really want an electric car. But I do not agree with the politics of the man who made the car or who was head of Tesla. And this was a, a, a tweet that he posted. Uh, DEI must die. Right. This is his famous slogan, DEI must die. And I just cringe when I saw it. It made me almost trade in the car. If that BMW electric ever gets as good as the Tesla, I'm gonna I'm gonna switch real fast. I need a couple more coins though to get the BMW electric because it's a little bit more expensive. All right. Uh, but I put this on the screen because I want us to follow what is happening to our DEI programs in corporate America. I take the cynical view that this is not as much about limiting leadership of people of color as much as it is a campaign strategy because the road to 2024 is through the classroom and through the office. That is my very cynical view that this is a strategy to energize the base, that somehow we are losing, we are at a tipping point, white America is losing its power is influence if you don't get out and vote for us then your way of life will die your women will be raped your women will intermarry your job will be gone uh your child won't get into college right it is playing on those fears because what did donna brazil say to mirror the fears. I would love to one day have uh, Dr. Lester because I know she is a uh, HR genius. I'm gonna tell you one of the best, one of the best interview tips I ever heard was from her, and I'm gonna let her tell you herself. But I would love to, love to, love to have her on to just talk about this issue of what's happening to DI in the workplace. So now let me give you the positives because we've talked about a lot of heavy stuff. I like to give you the bright line, right? The silver lining in some of this. So let's go to the next slide. And we only have uh, one more after this. Here's the thing. And I want to kind of equip you with some things to say as you hear these conversations. Because remember, this is about Black to the Future, the election of 2024. Now, some people say you should not make the business case for diversity and inclusion because to make the business case for diversity and inclusion means that all you're doing is monetizing Black bodies again in a different way. Got it. Understood. So you know that perspective. However, we know that uh, workplaces where there is a healthy culture of DEI have higher workplace satisfaction, have less turnover have higher and have higher profits. So if you're ever stuck in an office where somebody is making those political statements, well, DEI doesn't really help and you're, you know, you're hiring the worst person. Look, the data is clear and you can go to the uh, McKinsey report, diversity wins, diversity wins. Again, the case for diversity, go to the McKinsey report. It's all there. The data, the data is clear, all right? There is higher workplace satisfaction. There's less turnover. There are higher profits in places that have diverse board of trustees, in places that have more women on their boards, and then also in places that have more people of color on their board and that have a high reputa representation or a high uh, reputation for diversity and inclusion. Now, that's the business case, right? The intrinsic case is that it reflects our Christian values, right? We know that our God and that Jesus is an inclusive Christ. God is an inclusive God. But here's the thing that I really want you to know. And I say it, all of this to say, y'all, we really did win. Because all of these fear tactics that have been happening since the 1950s of not integrating schools, of the Willie Horton ad, of the Harold Ford Jr. ad, a lot of, a lot of it has been about the browning of America. The fear that the white majority is losing 
its power, its influence, and its numbers. And guess what? It is. U.S. kindergartens right now at this moment, I think it's third and below, is now already reflective of the global majority. Now, some people like to say majority, minority. I like to say the global majority because you know the world is brown, right? You guys know that the world is black and brown, right? Uh, so the U.S. will reflect the global majority by the presidential election of 2044. So no matter the tactics, no matter the lesions that have been thrown against us, the long game is that we will win and that we are winning. And that is for me in all the, even when I see the elections where we didn't get it that time. I remember the long game. And this gets me to my final slide. While the lesions may be many, the fear tactics may be many, the attack ads may be many, the demons may be many, God is mighty. And that is my closing thought on the election of 2024 and where we're headed. The next slide is just a thank you and questions. So I want to pause now and open it up for questions because we covered uh, 40 years or maybe 100 years of U.S. political history in about 40 minutes. Uh, Kim Collins, I think I see a hand for a question. Um, Dr. Stout, this was amazing. I um, really do appreciate um, the education, the learning, um, the knowledge transfer that you've provided for us. It's um, been very uh, thought-provoking. And uh, um, I'm a historian too, but I, I guess I'm a little bit self-described. And um, my grandmother was the president of the NAACP when I was a kid in my little small town of, in Ohio. And she was very civic-minded. So she always tried to give us um, a sense of being our civic duty you know, election polls and all that kind of good stuff. And she would have eaten this up with a spoon, I promise you. But I wanted to say that um, I remember probably in 2011, um, I'm a big national public radio listener and I was listening on the way to work one day and I believe Pat Buchanan, who is a self-described racist, white supremacist and how he has been, um, was talking about the fact that in 2030, the hue of this country was going to change. And he was even on the radio talking about um, how white America had to stand up to the coloring, the coloring he called it, um, of America. And his thought was not so much the African-Americans or black people, but his fear and what he was um, trying to tout was the coloring of the Hispanics and the mm -hmm. brown people, not the black people. And I was just amazed, um, even in that conversation that he said on the radio about just how open and verbal he was about the fear that he was trying to incite. Um, and uh, I was just amazed. And it continues today. I mean, if you want to if we want to look at it, it's been all throughout history about um, the fear of the other, and we always have been the other. I think it's you made a great point about um, our Hispanic brothers, sisters, and siblings, right? The question has always been, right, will they pass and assimilate into whiteness, or will there be a stronger affiliation with people of color and the um, and the challenges that people of color have faced. And so this is why you hear a lot about the 
the uh the oh goodness i can't remember what they call it the immigration train i don't remember the technical word right when they were like there is a band of refugees who are coming up through through uh texas or you know uh this is why you hear a lot about hispanic uh, immigration, right? Once again, it is a fear tactic that we are losing, right? Our way of life. We are losing the caravan. Thank you. Thank you. That's what they called it, the caravan. I try to stick mostly to things that intersected with African-American history in this one, but I could do a whole nother series or, or a scholar who's versed in that could do a whole nother series about the ways in which immigration has been used as a fear tactic. And what do these fear tactics do? I take the cynical approach that it is not necessarily about not teaching us our history. I think that is one. It is about winning elections. I think that is the bigger piece of it. I think that is the biggest piece of it. My opinion, my opinion, based on research, right? I think that is because fear tactics are one of the strongest ways to energize the base because a, void, a vote is what? The voice of the energized, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we'll we'll take hold it on to power. Yeah, we'll, we'll take one more question and I'll turn it over to Pastor Stewart. Does anyone else have a question about any of the things that we cover tonight, or just a thought, a question or a thought about something that we covered tonight. I had one. Uh, when you were talking about the communism, I thought about uh, Angela Davis and how, you know, she was so demonized in that time period and jailed and hunted down and all of that um, because of, you know, the fear tactic of communism and, you know, what she was doing, I think, in California at that time and actually had to, well, they thought she was out of the country, I think, at that time, and she really wasn't. But, you know, all of that history around that and the fear that they uh incited with other people around her, um, you know, the Black Panthers and all of that around communism. So thank you so much. This was good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I told you guys I went to Cuba in January and I like asked my tour guide like five times, can I see Angela Davis' house? Where's Angela Davis? Live? I want to <laughs> see her. I want to see where she used to live. He just kept looking at me like, who? I was like, you? <laughs> <laughs> She's a big deal, guys. Uh, so yes, and like I said, I think of all the places I visited, Cuba was probably the one that my mother was most afraid for me to travel to because of what we have been indoctrinated uh, with. And I'll tell you this, and then because this is just a little bit of a detour, uh, then I'll turn it over to Pastor Stewart. You know, the government and the people are two different things, right? right? Even, even here, right? The U.S. government and the U.S. people are often two different things. Uh, the Cuban people were warm and, hos and hospitable and really suffering under the weight of the U.S. embargo. Mm -hmm. uh, if you let me just do one tangent, because I think this is important since you called it in the room, because this is one place where I have been miseducated about. Um, when I went to Cuba, there, some of the shells were empty. Wow. There was food, but there was not choice. So, uh, do you guys get the difference? There is food, but there is not choice, right? We understand like not necessarily at the point of starvation, but not all the things that we need to live life and live it more abundantly. So I went to the nicest restaurants and I ate the same meal every other day because those were all the ingredients they had. As I was on the bus, people would knock on the bus and I've had aggressive folks, they were not aggressive, but they would knock on the bus and say, can we get a ride? Because I was on a private bus, can we get a ride? Because there's a fuel shortage because fuel, the U.S. prevents fuel from being um, shipped into Cuba. Cuba's big fuel trading partners was Russia, and we know what's going on over there, and Venezuela. 
And if you're not following what's going on in Venezuela, then you should follow the news about what's going on over there because our schools are changing because of what is happening in Venezuela and Honduras. I see it every day. I see those children, those families coming in every day. So once Venezuela and Russia start going through their own personal political tensions, that really shrunk the lifetime lifeline for Cuba. And the Cuban people, who many of them look just like us. Let me say that again. Many of them look just like us. Most of them look just like us. Uh, I know you saw Ricky Ricardo on I Love Lucy, but most of them look just like us are really suffering under the weight of the U.S. embargo. And the prediction is, and then I'll turn it over to uh, Pastor Stewart, is that it is too political of a topic. You will upset the rich Cubans in Florida if you mess with the embargo now. And so maybe if Biden wins again, he will address the embargo in his second election. But he can't because he wants to keep Florida in play. That is the political strategy since we're talking about politics tonight. Uh, but if you ever get a chance to visit Cuba, it is a beautiful country and one that I was totally miseducated on. Thank you, Pastor Stewart. I hand it over to you. Uh, can we take a moment and celebrate what we've heard over the past few weeks and just express our appreciation to Dr. Stout in the chat, or if you want to unmute for a second and say it out loud verbally, um, I know that I have certainly been enlightened and blessed by all of these sessions. And tonight, tonight's session, I, I could just run around my office because it is so timely and so fitting and appropriate, considering that we are in the middle of uh, election season here that Tuesday is Super Tuesday, and last night, as I was watching the news, um, they were saying that the numbers, even for voting in Memphis, are down from 2020, and we are in a 911 situation. <laughs> I mean, this this conversation could not, could not have been more timely for such a time as this. I also want to say that as I was listening to uh, Dr. Stout talk about how communism has been used over the years for fear mongering. The irony is that one of the persons that's running for president is in bed with Russia. Uh, <laughs> and the interesting thing is that now you really don't hear much about communism like you did when people were accusing King of being a communist and wiretapping his phone. Communist, communist was the boogeyman word, if you will, to, uh, it was a lightning rod, all rooted in misinformation. And, and I was even thinking about how, as you were talking about mirroring fears, most of what the fears rest on is mirrored in, in misinformation and propaganda, uh, which really reminded me of what they did to Jesus. Same thing, same church, different pew, same song, different chorus. So the game is not changing. It's the same game. And I would say tonight, he or she that has an ear, let them hear what the spirit is saying. And not only hear, but pay attention. Take heed to what is happening because we are certainly in some very critical times. And this is certainly not a time for us to be disinterested about what's happening to us. Uh, because if, 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 if the other contender wins, he has no intention of ever coming out of office again. And we won't be fighting against communism. We will be living communism. <laughs> so this is serious. It's really serious. So I thank you for bringing that, giving us that historical perspective and taking us all the way back and reminding us of how in every season, it's been the same thing. It's the same. It's the same playbook. Just misinformation where fear rooted in misinformation. Uh, the other thing I want to mention, I mentioned this earlier when you mentioned the um, Highlander Institute, and I did have my information partially correct, but Reverend Vahisha put a note in the chat that I thought 
needs to be repeated. She said our church member, Ashley Woodard Henderson is co-director of the Highlander Research and Education Center, which has been targeted as being communist to lessen the impact, impact of radical black folk like King and Rosa Parks and so many others that have been trained there. So I was correct. Ashley is still the co-director. I wasn't sure uh, Vahisha, if she was still there, but she still is. And I would, I would certainly add that when you pray, call her name uh, because she's up against a lot of resistance and it didn't just start. This has been ongoing really since she started uh, visiting and attending our church. So re remember her name, Ashley Woodard Henderson. And maybe at some point, you know, we, I've already told Dr. Stout that this is this cannot end uh, tonight. Perhaps it won't be every week, maybe once a quarter or every other month. But uh, the kind of interest and the kind of information that Dr. Stout has been sharing with us uh, is so necessary for us. And so I'm twisting her arm uh, and she is uh She's gradually uh, coming into agreement with her pastor. I'll just put it that way. <laughs> she is coming into agreement with her pastor. And uh, we just, we're just grateful that she said yes and thankful to all of you who have joined us over these past four weeks. Uh, we really need to get some kind of a name, list of names of all of you that have attended all four sessions so we can give you some kind of certificate of completion showing that you've completed I mean, this is serious. We, we we got a scholar teaching us. This is we ain't this ain't, we ain't playing. You understand? We need to give you some kind of a certificate for your investment of time. Of course, you would be on the honor system, uh, but I think we do need to uh, document. And somebody say, I want my CEUs. <laughs> yeah, we need to document this in some kind of way. So I'm going to I'm going to ask Deacon Sean if she will advise us on how we can capture the names of, of persons who've attended all four sessions so that we can give you some kind of certificate of completion. Dika Sean. Uh, just drop your name in the chat. We can capture it from the chat. She says it's the okay. honor system for real, for real. <laughs> now, we I, honor missed, honor system, I missed so. one, but I listened to you two. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and just on that point, I just want to thank Pastor Stewart because I thought like it would be like four people plus my mom. And I have been pleasantly shocked every week that not only that you came, but you came and you stayed and then you came back. I was like, oh, they're not going to come next week. Oh, they're not. And every week you have. And it's just, it has just filled my heart. Uh, thank you for allowing a space for a, a history nerd. Um, I, I have, I have enjoyed it and I, I hope you have too. So thank you, Pastor Stewart. Pastor Stewart been asking me to do this for probably a year and a half. <laughs> I'm just going to be honest. Uh, That's correct. You for, for, your, for your persistence. Thank you. Yeah, because you know, it, it really started with the CRT situation, the critical race theory. And I said to Kat, Dr. Stout, that, you know, we don't have to, rely strictly upon the school system to teach our history. Uh, as I've traveled internationally, one of the things that I have admired about many of our international brothers and sisters in Liberia, in Jamaica, in Guyana, in areas where they really don't have a lot of resources, but they have schools. And they have schools that not only teach their children about the faith, but they also teach them about their history. And so I'm just grateful that this has finally come full circle and uh, hopefully this won't be the end of it. So please put your name. We'll, we'll even give you credit if you uh, watch the videos. We'll give you credit. Since this is a, a last minute kind of decision to, to do these certificates, we'll, we'll err on the side of grace and uh, get, still give you a certificate for your investment of time. But please make sure you put your name in the chat tonight so that we can uh, get a certificate uh, to you. All right. All right, uh, Pastor Marilyn, uh, Dr. Kapp, you have anything else you wanna share? No, just just thank you again. And thank you to uh, Deacon Sean and uh, Pastor uh, uh, Andridge. 
in her absence for just organizing everything and always making me look good on the tech. So thank yes, you to the, the team friends. of D and D of uh, of Dandridge and Davenport right? <laughs> of CNBC. Amen. I'm going to ask um, um, Pastor Marilyn if you'll lead us in prayer in, in our closing prayer. Okay. Thank you. God, we do give you thanks. We're so grateful to you, for, to you tonight uh, for this outpouring of so much history, God. Thank you for the sacrifice of time for Dr. Stout, Lord, and thank you for the vision of Pastor Stewart, Lord, to teach us uh, our history, oh God. Thank you for all that you've given us and for such a rich history, oh God, for such a chosen people. We're so grateful to you, God. And now tonight, oh God, we pray that this won't be the last time that we gather for such a purpose, oh God. Thank you, Lord, for how you fill in the gaps. We're so grateful. Please help us to have a good night tonight, Lord, and then wake us up tomorrow refreshed, oh God. And then, Lord, help us to remember our own history, oh God. And for the next time we gather, Lord, help it to be more people, oh God. Thank you, Lord, for the blessing. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. And remember what Dr. Stout said, in the end, we win. <laughs> Good night. Yeah.